I'm asking believers, evangelicals, that they are pro-Israel, to hear that there is a local Christians here. We are proud to be part of Israel state. The reality is in our region, the face of Christianity is disappearing. Our language, it's very old, uh, 5,000 years old, 3,000 before Jesus Christ and the 2,000s from Jesus Christ until now. Nowadays, people just go and make a DNA exam just to know from where their roots came from. I know from where my roots came from. When we talk about Israel, we usually talk about the Jewish people. But in this episode, we're gonna talk about the Christian groups in Israel. We know the gospel was taking around the world and now it's coming back to Israel. From the time of the Messiah, 2,000 years ago, we see that there were always a small remnant of Christian groups who stayed here. Some of them went through a lot of persecution in order to keep a Christian presence in the land. But when we walk in the, around the streets of Jerusalem, we see different groups of Christians who stayed here, preserved the holy sites. They never gave up. Some of them are ancient community and some of them are modern community. And one thing that they all had in common, they all believe in serving the Messiah here in Israel. For the people of the Middle East, identity is both incredibly important and complex at the same time. You could be an Arabic-speaking Christian who's not necessarily ethnically Arab. The language, the culture, the ethnicity, the religion don't always align here. I know it almost sounds counterintuitive for us as Westerners looking into the Middle East, and to really grasp the life and the dynamics of this place, you have to understand the powers at play. We are here only 14,000 Christians in Jerusalem. I'm afraid in the next 10 years, pilgrims come here to visit only a stones and a church and never meet the local community, the first Christians. When we use the Aramaic language, we give a real life because our Aramaic language and the Holy Land is our dying language. So slowly, bit by bit, it's through Israel, this part of the world is being pieced together. It's uh, coming back to life. This is the Middle East where Christianity began and spread to the entire world. Over the past century, the number of Christians in the region has been declining rapidly, and it shows no sign of stopping. This is largely due to increased persecution and a mass exodus of Christians from the region. It's been predicted that by 2025, Christians will make up only about 3% of the Middle East population. But when it comes to Israel, the numbers are unique. The Christian population has actually increased over the past several decades. This is a rare exception in the Holy Land, where Jesus and his first followers began their mission. But let's take a step back to learn the story of Christianity in the land, starting from the Book of Acts. To get a better understanding of this history, I met up with Petra Helt. Her perspective on Christian history was not only enlightening, it was inspiring. If I asked you, who are the Christians in Israel today, what would the answer to that be? We can say there are something like four families. The Oriental Orthodox churches, they have their patriarchs here, they have congregations, communities are wonderful, they are recognized by the state of Israel. The same is with the second family. The Greek Orthodox church is probably the biggest church in the country. They are here forever, <laughs> since the beginning of Christianity. Then we have the Catholic church, and they have many, many churches and communities and hospitals and lay centers and you name it. And then we have the many different Protestants churches. So let's zoom back a bit in history, all the way back to the first century. How, how does Christianity sort of set up shop in Israel? How does it spread? And then how does it create a presence in the land? Well, I mean, it all started with Shavuot, with Pentecost. And I would like to read from the Bible. When the day of Shavuot had arrived, they were all gathered together in one place. And now there were Jewish people residing in Jerusalem pious ones from every nation under heaven. Yehuda, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia from Egypt, visitors from Rome, both Jewish people by birth and converts from Judaism. Every time there's the high holidays, coming back to the land, celebrating together, going back. That's right. So they, they were good Jews. They, they really wanted to come for the three pilgrimage feasts. 
and they heard this enormous message for which they already prayed for for hundreds of years that the Messiah will come, the Mashiach Bar. So the Messiah came and they said Jesus is a Messiah. So they went back to their home countries all over the world. And so they spread all over this message. And then it is as it is with Jews all the time. Some said yes and some said no. And then Peter and all the disciples, they went after them and they didn't spread the message only amongst the Jews, but amongst the Gentiles. The further away the seed of the Jewish Messiah went from the Hebrew culture, from Israel, the more it integrated with other cultures. And of course, each time it changes a little bit. And so this is how Christianity then spread and spread, and the schools of thought developed. 638, the conquest of the land, the whole Middle East was occupied by Islam and the Mediterranean as well. And the Mediterranean became like the Iron Curtain between East and West. Suddenly there was East and West. As Islamic rule separated the Eastern and Western churches, the West was almost entirely cut off from Jerusalem and the roots of the faith. This allowed for anti-Jewish ideas and violent anti-Semitism to creep in and eventually become part and parcel with the Western church in Europe. The Eastern Church also drifted from its origins, but the access to Jerusalem and the rest of the Holy Land made the Jewish roots of the faith more deeply ingrained in the Eastern Orthodox Christianity. For the majority of history in the Middle East, this is what a church looked like. An ancient building dating back all the way to the time of the early Orthodox and Catholic Church. A time where ethnicity, where identity were intertwined strongly with the religion and the faith of the people in this region. But the deeper you dig into the culture, into the people, into the faith of these people, the richer the story becomes. I had the privilege of visiting St. Mark's Syrian Orthodox Monastery in the old city of Jerusalem. The Syrian Orthodox are part of the Eastern Church, and they trace their history back to the Book of Acts. Under Islam, they nearly lost their native language, Aramaic, the very same language spoken by Jesus, and they largely assimilated into Arab culture. To this day, they still speak Arabic and are often mistakenly identified as Arabs. But now, as part of Israel, they are resurrecting their ancient identity and language. Hello. How are you? What a place! I met with Father Bulos, who is a big part of that process. So our church, we can divide the three parts. We have part for the woman and we have part for the man. They're separated in yes, the church. Yes, separate, yes. Similar to a synagogue. Yes, synagogue, yes, it's Interesting. Same. Our traditional, we put Bible in the mm. middle. So our Bible should be written by handwriting. Beautiful. Yes. Again, you've showed us two different things that are already similar to the Jewish tradition. Yes. Our language, it's very old. 5,000 years old, 3,000 before Jesus Christ and the 2000s from Jesus Christ until now. It was the Jesus language. When he was talking with his disciples until now, we use it. When I was 12, I came to monastery. Something took my soul to the monastery. First of all, the language, the language of Jesus Christ. They t taught me how to write or to sing, or to, to use the language. Part of something that has a continuity for thousands of years is a very powerful experience, knowing that you're walking in the footsteps of someone who's done this 100, 1,000, 3,000, you know. Awesome, exactly. So we reach now in the upper room. Here, we remember, he, he established Christian Pesach. Here in this area. Here in this very place. So we remember when Jesus was in the upper room, when he took the bread. I can't sing in little, little It was an amazing experience to hear Bolu sing the very words Jesus used when he walked this earth. The Syrian Orthodox Christians are one of many Christian communities that nearly lost their identity and began speaking Arabic. Millennia later, in Israel today, most of these Arabic-speaking Christians attend Arabic-language schools and identify more strongly with Israel's Muslim population. This causes a disconnect between Israel's Christian and Jewish populations. We're heading towards East Jerusalem to meet with Elias, who's one of the people behind the Jerusalemite Initiative. And their goal is to connect 
this Christian minority, specifically in Jerusalem, but in also other parts of the country, to the general public, financially, economically, ed from an education and language perspective. Hi, shalom. Good to see you. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you. I am a co-founder of the Jerusalemite Initiative, side by side with my Jewish colleagues. We are Christians and Jewish in this organization to focus on one goal, to integrate Arab-speaking Christians, but not Arab Christians. Can you explain why the distinction is important, why it's important for you personally to separate the two? We had a, a, a tough life here, the Islamic uh, occupation, the Ottoman Empire occupation. We lost our language. And nowadays that you are speaking Arabic, it doesn't mean that you are Arab. You feel that there is a distance between you and your neighbors. They speak Hebrew, you speak Arabic, there is no connection between you and them. And then suddenly you find that the Christianity came and built on the Judaism. Without Judaism, there is no Christianity. Mm -hmm. In the school, it told me the opposite. And we learn it inside the Christian schools in Jerusalem. Elias is referring to how Arabic-speaking Christians learn in Arab schools in Israel and the Palestinian territories. These schools teach the history of Christianity and modern Israel from an Arab and often Muslim perspective. When we looked around us what happened during the last 10 years for the minorities and our neighbors here, like in Syria and Lebanon and Iraq, mm -hmm. it's really horrible. So this was the first alarm for the Christians here to think about how can we protect ourselves, our families, our churches, our convents. So the first step was to integrate and to feel more close to the state, mm -hmm. to the society. This is the first thing that any Christian here think about it when you just look around us. We are living here in a heaven in Israel as a minority, as a Christian here. Definitely. After four years working with the community in Jerusalem, especially with the young, nowadays there is a positive thing that they are coming to me, they are connecting me. They text me, they want to be part, they want to volunteer, they want to serve. The Israeli army is a huge part of the culture and socialization that takes place here. But Israeli Muslims and Arabic-speaking Christians typically don't serve. That's why Elias and his co-founders made serving in the IDF a central part of their vision for integration of Christians into the Israeli society. Jiris, good to see you. You're welcome. I'm I met with Samuel Jiris, who is the highest ranking Christian serving in the Israeli border police. His three children also served in the IDF. He is a shining example of exactly that integration. Yes, there's a mishpat that I'm saying every time, the years have been able to get to Yerushalayim. I'd be interested to know what your Christian faith means to you. Is it something that motivates your everyday actions? The Israeli Christian dilemma is a complicated one. It highlights just how much has changed in this region in the past 2,000 years. But God is hard at work restoring his followers to their rightful identity. It requires a shift in understanding and a call to action to bring about such a big change in the way Christians see themselves as part of the Holy Land tapestry. We are part of State of Israel. We are Israeli Christians. Mm -hmm. To any Christian in the Holy Land that needs mm -hmm. any help, we are ready to help them with our full faith, really. In the same way that the Jewish people emerge out of the pages of history back into the land, they brought back all these lost Christian people. You have hope again. If the Jews managed to do this, why shouldn't we try to do it? Yeah, it's a plan so complex that only God could come up with it. For God, everything is possible. I took a trip all the way up north to the Sea of Galilee to meet with Father Francesco. Look at this view. Yes, 
This is beautiful. He is the director of the Domus Galilei Seminary that initiates Catholic clergy into something called the Neocotecumenal way, or just the way to keep things simple. This is an international center, a monastery, serving all the pilgrims coming from all over the world, especially from our way of faith that we call Neocotecumenal way. It's a way of faith to rediscover the richness of our baptism in the Catholic Church, to rediscover all the richness of their faith. This way born by two Spanish people, Kiko Arguello and Carmen Hernandez, in order to uh, bring the Vatican Council II to all the parishes. So the Vatican Council II was a positive revolution because the church uh, tried to look for her identity. So rediscovering the roots of our faith, they rediscovered also the Jewish roots. Uh, people think about Vatican II, from my perspective being a Jew in Israel, it's this pivotal moment in the history of Christianity, specifically Catholicism, where they retract the previous statements about the Jewish people and say, well, we, we were wrong. We want to restore the relationship with the Jewish people, and the calling of the Jewish people is irrevocable. That's the, the words they use, right? Yes. The more I spoke with Francesco, the more I understood just how impactful the way has been, both within and outside the Catholic Church. A crowd of pilgrims or communities come here Christians from different confessions. And also it's amazing that a lot of Jews, religious and not religious. It's amazing because they want to listen about us, also singing in Hebrew, proclaiming the word of God, the Tanakh, kind of, let us say, of communion, of uh, an atmosphere of uh, love and friendship. And at the same time, also a lot of Arabs. So it's, it's an open house to, to all the people who want to come and to, to go deep in the holy places. I'd be interested in hearing what the experience of someone such as yourself, what does it feel like and look like on a daily basis? Yeah, first of all, for me, this way of faith was an instrument of salvation for my family because uh, it's not that we were engaged you know, in this movement as uh, very good people, no. We were in death and Jesus Christ came through this way inside of the Catholic Church and saved my family. We had a living experience of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who died for us and rise again for us. It became personal. Uh, exactly. God is bringing more and more Catholic believers into a deeper relationship with him and leading them to embrace the Jewish people. As Francesco showed me around the facility, I quickly realized that their theology and ideology are incorporated into everything you see. The spirit of this house is that all the people coming here feel this kind of love through beauty, because beauty is a sign of love. This is quite a scene. According to the renewal of the Vatican Council II, to promote a Latin actuosa participazione. This is our library, and the idea of the library is, of, first of all, the stars and the universe. And uh, at the center of the universe, there is the Torah. Uh, just to explain, this is the same Bible that every Jewish synagogue around the world would have. Yes. This is a sculpture of Jesus teaching the Sermon on the Mount to the 12 apostles. Beautiful. Not a bad location. <laughs> Listen, Israel. The Lord is our God. It was especially moving to hear Francesco and a group of young priests sing their own rendition of Shema Yisrael, one of the central prayers in Judaism. Hear, O Israel. Israel. It became this interesting position of people and faith where you, you can be a bridge between cultures and religions. We tell to the people, come and see. Come and see, as in the Gospel because it's a kind of experience, a so deep experience, a living experience of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Shalom, everybody. With us today, we have Father Peter. Father Peter served in Israel for 38 years and it's a great honor having him on our show. Samuel, a real pleasure being on TBN with you. Yes, it's really great, an honor. great honor. Father Peter, so you see your involvement in the Catholic Church and what's going on in Israel as a very important thing. 
Well, I'm, I'm a Brooklyn boy. Uh, and I came to the Holy Land in 1984. Mm -hmm. I had a, well, definitely a club, but I had a crazy lifestyle. I had a lot of money, a lot of girlfriends, uh, fast cars, traveled around the world. And one day I just said, is this all there is in life? And I felt very empty inside. So I went to a Trappist monastery outside of Atlanta for four months on weekends asking myself basic philosophical mm -hmm. questions. And eventually, one of those days in the chapel, I picked up a book. It happened to be the Jerusalem Bible. I opened the, the page, and in the, in the foreword is the beautiful uh, Jerusalem cross. It was like an ax that mm. just sliced me in two. Fell, knelt, knelt down, started crying, and then I said, that's it. I sold everything I had, gave it to the poor, Join the Franciscans, and the rest is history. Now I'm the working for God and His people, so I'm the happiest guy. So around. let's talk about what you do in Israel. My main, uh, uh, I would say, job that I do have is basically the Franciscan Foundation for the Holy Land as president. And so what the foundation is doing is attempting to stem the Christian exodus. The problem is, as there has been, as we all know, an exodus from the Holy Land. Yes. So. They're sort of caught in the middle, okay? And they have no world government, no world organizations helping them, and our Christians in general are leaving. What we do is we will give a free college education to any Christian, uh, any university of their choice in Israel itself, uh, as wow. far as Jordan. And we have over now 600 Christian students who are taking courses or have graduated from, from courses uh, and finished their college Beautiful. degree. That's the only way to keep them here. That's right. right. They, they give That's... them incentives and motivation. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit more about different groups? I think uh, most Christians today in the Holy Land, local Christians, uh, local inhabitants, know that they've been here for centuries. They lived here, they toiled here, they're, that's, that they received their salvation here. But I admire them and I will always fight for them and, and do whatever I can for any Christian here in the Holy Land for any help that they need. Father Peter, Christian people are watching you from all over the world. Do you have a message from Jerusalem? Tell us what God puts on your heart. I think that God, what God is telling all of us that we need to help our brothers and sisters in Christ. In 60 years, most of the church officials say that Christianity could easily disappear from the very place where Christ founded his church. And all we're going to have, my fellow brothers and sisters, are empty religious monuments and museums and no living worshiping community. We cannot have that. We have to maintain our Christian presence in the Holy Land. It is so important. So I think the main thing is realizing that this is our land also, and we need to, we need to maintain it. Father Peter, what a great honor. For a me Samuel, especially. A real pleasure. Great, great honor. And to you, our viewers, thank you for being with us on this show, Inside Israel and the Middle East. Thank you for joining us as we provide a spiritual insight of what God is doing in Israel and in the Middle East. If you want to learn more about what God is doing in Israel, make sure to visit us on our webpage and follow us on social media. Shalom and God bless you for Jerusalem.